Well, my father was murdered by an apartheid assassin called Eugene de Kock. And basically what happened was he was driving um, into Nelspreet. And as he was driving with four other men, as they approached the Nelspreet Bridge, um, Eugene de Kock and his team ha had been waiting for them. And they started shooting at the vehicle. So the vehicle started losing control. And as it just approached and it got under the Nelspreet Bridge, Eugene de Kock realized that the vehicle wasn't coming to a halt. So he decided to run down the bridge and he emptied his gun uh, magazine on my father. Afterwards, he continued to douse the vehicle in fuel. He set them alight. They further doused it in fuel and then they set it alight again. And they went on about their day. And the news read that my dad and his team were basically against the government and they were killed. And yeah. Uh, my father was bombed by <coughs> de Kock and Nivolt. And I say the rest of them because they were all involved in it. My father used to, when he was not being a policeman, he used to take a lot of pictures and videos. There was a lot of claims of why my father was killed. One of the claims was because they were going to go forward about certain people's deaths or killings. From what I've heard, they, they were called into a meeting. They, they had to go into a car <clears throat> in Motherwell. So when they got into that car, the car was bombed. So it was a trap, basically. So that's how my father was murdered. I'm Candice Mama. Um, I'm 24 years old and I'm from Joburg. Uh, I am C. Andawel Amkoduga and I'm from Port Elizabeth. I can't remember how I found out exactly. Um, I grew up not having a father. So when we moved from one township to a suburb, there was remnants of that there was a father figure in this house. You know, so I would play in the garage and I would find his handcuffs somewhere in the garage. Or I'd find his boots, you know, somewhere. Or his uniform here and there. So there was remnants of there was a male figure, there was a father figure somewhere. Back in my mind, I knew I had a father, but I didn't find out in a certain way. It's, it's funny because I didn't actually hear the story. Um, I found out the story, and it was a complete coincidence. I went, and my mom always used to host people. And when people would come to the house, she'd send me for this book. And she told them some sort of a story about how my dad had died. And I thought to myself, but I want to see. I want to see what's in this book that I'm not allowed, you know, to see. So I went, and my mom was gone, and I took the book, and I opened it. And when I saw the page, it was just my dad's burnt body clutching a steering wheel. And I closed the book very quickly and I just threw it into the cupboard and I never spoke of it. I was just scared because I thought to myself, well, if my dad was a good person, then how could he die in such a brutal way? And since I was only nine and I couldn't tell anyone, I just kept it to myself. And further on in life, as I grew older, I started discovering more details about more or less what had happened, but I didn't ask too many questions. Um, I still have that book to this day, you know, um, I keep it with me. And I think it's become a story of more for me personally, at least, it's just every time I look at that, you know, I think to myself, I can't waste my life. What difference would I sit down and have made? Um, if there was more dialogue, maybe, but it makes no difference to me whether there was a sit down or not. I think me finding out the way that I found out influenced me in certain things. My father used to, when he was not being a policeman, he used to take a lot of pictures and videos and do gardening and so forth, so artistic side of things. So it influenced me to look at things in a similar way on how to connect certain dots. I knew that, of course, at a certain point, I had to acknowledge and tell my mom that this is what I did. I read the book. And because my mom herself wasn't really sure of the details of how it happened and why it happened, you know, so she was really clueless, and her way of dealing with it was like shouting, like, hey, don't, don't speak to me about that. How did my mother deal with the loss of my father? Um, books, which is law books, she had to protect herself. The last conversation I had with my mother about my father was probably about 15 years ago, I think. I can't remember. I remember her crying, which was the first time me seeing her cry. I think it was because there was this kid in primary school whose father had passed away and then a year later the mother remarried.
So I was like, it must be nice, you know. So I think that kind of sparked some emotion with me. And then I went home and I, I can't remember what I was saying to my mother about, but I mentioned father. It was my first time saying father. Why don't I have a father? I wish I had a father or something like that. And then that's when she got into it. She started crying, but she said it was probably God's will, you know. Uh, if, he was, if he would have been alive, we don't know how, what a man he would have turned out to be, maybe, you know, maybe he wouldn't have been the good man that we knew him at that stage, you know. You know, it's, it's ironic because I was very hard on my mom mentally, at least, um, growing up, you know. Um, I thought, this is what you should have done, and this, and this, and this is how you should have raised me, blah, blah, blah. But then it got to a point when I reached womanhood, and I look back on my mom's decisions, and I realized she did the best she could under this situation, you know, and the card she was dealt. And, I mean, she was very young. When all of this happened to her, she was the age that I am now, which is 24, and she had to deal with losing her husband, having two children, both under the age of four, and really not knowing what she's going to do with her life. I think during the TRC hearings, that's when things were more clear to me, that, okay, well, my father was killed in this manner by these people. So I think that's how I officially found out. But there was never a sit down to say, hey, I remember very clearly how it felt like. Um, well, I remember being leaving the TRC and they went to court. And uh, I remember having a sense of hate and anger and wanting to kill this man that did that because of his uh, actions towards me, which is Nivot, Nochido Nivot, because of his actions to me. That's, that was the first time I've ever felt a sense of retaliation, anger, and bitterness. And those actions being, during the court sessions, there was a break, and then you know, everyone had a break outside, and then we were moving back inside. Nivot looked at me, he stuck his tongue out and he did that to me, you know. So that was my first encounter with, oh, okay, well, these are the feelings that I have to have towards these people. Yes, I was about six or seven at the time. Mm. So one day I walked into the house and my mom, she says, I got a call from the National Prosecuting Authority. And she says they want to know if, if we want to meet Eugene de Kock, but it's not a must. You can or you, you don't have to or, you know. And I, immediately I just said, yes, um, I want to meet him. And she looked at me and she said, oh, okay, well, if, if you're gonna go, then I'll come with you. We, we got to the prison and they took us to a boardroom and then they give us tea and they brief us and they say, okay, you know, this is what this meeting is about. Don't be afraid of asking questions, you know, just be yourself and it will be over. If at any point you don't feel comfortable, please let us know. So my family being very lighthearted and jokey about everything, we just started teasing each other and we were like, haha, you know, this is what's happening, can you believe it? And we were laughing and it was okay. I was speaking to my younger brother who was sitting next to me and I turned around and as I turned around, the empty chair that had been assigned to Eugene, he was there. We, we didn't know what to say, we just looked. And the pastor said, Okay, I'm going to introduce everyone at the table. And we started with my mom who was the furtherest. And um, he said, that's Sandra Mama, uh, widow of the deceased, Glenok Masilo Mama. And Eugene leaned forward and he said, it's a pleasure to meet you. And we looked at him. And he introduced my grandfather. And then he introduced my older brother. And then he introduced my younger brother, myself. And with each one of us, Eugene would lean forward and say, it's a pleasure to meet you. It's a pleasure to meet you. It's a pleasure to meet you. And my mom, thank goodness, she took the lead and she said, all I want to know is why. Why my husband and what happened? And not even a moment's hesitation, Eugene just launched into the entire story of how my dad had been killed, how he ran down the bridge, how he did everything. And he remembered it as if it had happened yesterday. He gave us details until I was sitting back in my chair and just, at one point I thought, I wanted to just say to him, stop, <laughs> stop, it's enough, it's okay, we know, it's okay. And we did. Um, my mom just said, okay, I think that's, that's all I needed to know. She said to him, okay, Eugene, I just want you to know I forgive you. 
And then it got to me and I took a pause and we looked at each other and I was about to say I forgive you, but there were so many things I still wanted to say. And he actually stopped me and he basically went on to tell me about his family and how his life had gone and what had led him to those events. And I said, you know, thank you for sharing that with me. I, I want to know something. I, I do want to say I forgive you, which I do. But I want to know, do you forgive yourself? And at that moment, he avoided eye contact and he, and he kind of just shifted around the room. And I think out of the whole encounter, that was the first time I saw him uncomfortable. That was the first time I saw him flinch. So I looked at him in the eyes and I said, I'm sorry, but you didn't answer my question. Do you forgive yourself? And he looked at me and he said, when you've done the things I've done, how can you forgive yourself? And I think at that moment, I sat back and I saw the sincerity that just in, was just in the room. I just saw it. And, and I saw him like look away to dab the side of his eye. I just couldn't stop crying. And afterwards, I think my, my mom followed suit crying. And after a while, we just thought, you know, this is pretty much it. I stood up first because, of course, I was the closest to him. And I walked up to him and I said, would you mind if I gave you a hug? And he looked at me and he shifted in his seat and he stood up and he gave me a hug. And as he gave me a hug, he said, your father would have been so proud of the woman you have become. And I'm so sorry for what I've put you through. And all of a sudden I thought, did I embrace the person who killed my father? You know, was, is he a master manipulator and he like fooled me? Is, you know, you start, I started asking myself all these questions. And then I, I discussed it with my family and I was like, how did you feel? I don't want to give them ideas or notions on how to feel. I said, how did you experience his sincerity? Do you think it was genuine? And, you know, was it sincere in your opinion? And everyone in my family, without a shadow of a doubt, said that's how I felt it. So it's been an incredibly intense roller coaster. When I hear the stories about the car, how do I feel? Uh... To me, he's just one of the few men who were involved in killing my dad and killing other people's parents. Exactly. How do you become that person? How, how does life navigate you on that route to being able to kill without any conscience and a conscience? And he, told, he just told us a story that, you know, at the end of the day, he, all he wanted to do was be a soldier and he saw his father being a soldier and that was what was revered in his world and how he was raised. In his opinion, he wasn't fighting black people. He was fighting people that were against his government and that were against his people. I think the one point I asked was, but surely it stems from a place of racism. You, you must be racist. And he said, I don't consider myself racist. And I thought, out of all of this, you're going to start lying to me now, you know? <laughs> he says that in his time, he never looked at a black person and thought, I hate you because you're black. He said he always came from a standpoint that you're trying to destabilize and destroy my country. You know, it's kind of saying I'm not racist because I've got a black friend. My question would be, what if I were to kill your, your kid right now? Because I'd probably do it. Well, how would you feel now? And then I come back to you later and I'm, I'm sorry because you must understand this is how I grew up after what you did. But I don't, you know, stem from that, uh, you know, bigger branch, you know, I, I'm, no, I don't. So I feel, I feel, I feel, I feel interested, I, I'm interested to hear all these things. Why did he, who, 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 who coordinated this, this, these meetings? Why? After how long? while he was serving his sentence. Why was there a priest there? You know, why? You know, so uh, I'm interested in the dress up, you know, <clears throat> of this whole situation. Uh, you know, so in it's a pleasure to meet you. Why, why, why is this pleasurable for you? I have no ambitions of forgiving. Maybe I'll grow older and wiser, but I have none of those ambitions for forgiving these men. 
Because I was never approached. The only time I was approached, like I told you, is when Nivo gave me the finger. That's my interaction with them. I said, before I even got into the prison and looked at Eugene in the eyes, I'd forgiven him. Only because I, I thought to myself, you robbed me of my father. You robbed me of a life I could have had. And I will not let you rob me of my tomorrow. And I will not let you have the power to rob me of my happiness and joy and experiencing life. Does my anger burden? It's somewhat, somewhat, somewhat functional. It becomes, it's become numb for me, the anger and the bitterness, so-called bitterness. Like if, if, if at some point if I see you know, my kids and they have you know, mother, the father, uh, I know what that is able to to do for you when you have a mother and a father, because I see it from the white kids, you know, because most of my friends who are black, they don't have fathers, <clears throat> you know, so I can immediately make out the difference, you know, or previously when I was at tertiary or college, you can see the difference in how they live and how we live directly from not having two parents. I mean, uh, my dad, was killed when I was 18 months. And th the only way that I knew that he was around was through a picture that, because he always used to be behind the camera, was through a picture that he had taken. He was never be in any shots that he's taken. You know, on any photo albums, you would never see my dad. So he was the only one that's taking photos. So the only way I knew that our case was that, that was w when I saw a picture of myself when I was Probably a couple of months before he was killed, I'm looking into the camera and to me and my sister, and he's behind the camera, you know. So you know, I'm looking at him and so forth. So that's that's how I know, you know. I just came into this world, boom, you no know, dad, kind of thing, you know. So, you know, so there's a lot of these things that she literally handled on her own, you know? not to take anything away from anyone who forgives. <laughs> Definitely forgive if you can. But I am always a, a bit cautious of forgiving too quickly and then actually having to deal with that on your own now when the person you said you've forgiven, they've walked away feeling like, okay, I've been forgiving. And you have to, on your own, carry this, oh, I thought I'd forgiven this person, but I Plus, I have no reason to forgive him anyway, whatsoever. So, you know, that's on my part. Uh, Question for you: If if you were to see or meet, you know, Dikok or Hilion Nivot kids, mm. you know, how would you react to them? How would you? I don't know. Oh. I think I I can't tell you. Yeah. But I know it wouldn't be anger. So I think pre pre this age of forgiveness and living mm. free and lighter for me. I think my response would have probably been a, a rather aggressive one because I dealt with a lot of aggression. But now, I, it would just, I don't know how it would impact mm. me. I think I'd want to know if, how, how their experiences were. Mm. I'd, I'd want to find out from them if, if them lacking a father, whether the father deserved it or not, regardless was similar to my experience, what feeling would you have? Like for me, I'm here. I'm still in this country. I carry it. And then you have the ability just to run away and go to England or Australia and live out your life there. And not even, actually, you know what? This is what happens this is what my dad did. I would love to engage with them and be like, hey, so, how was your day? How's your life? How's England, lad? I'm pretty sure those kids go to therapy. You know, oh, yes, my dad killed people. And, you know, black people, 90, 80, 90%, they never went to therapy. And something's going to happen if you keep on being overlooked. You know, things are already happening, but, you know, it's, if you keep on acting as if... Yeah. There's something that's really going to happen, so... But do you think, on that, do you think that the sins of our parents should be our own? Should, should, should we pay for the sins of our fathers or mothers? No, of course not. But if you know that 
You know, it's like a friend. If a friend of yours hurts somebody else that you know, whatnot, you will at some point say, hey man, I'm sorry for my friend. They, they didn't mean it that way, or yes, they were being an idiot, or so on and so forth. You know? So the collective so, voice. It's a collective, I think, yeah. I think the biggest problem is when people don't understand what apartheid actually did. And it goes so much deeper and so much, it's so much more scarring than the fact that you were poor. It is the fact that you weren't even recognized as a human mm. being. And I think when people can start to acknowledge that, we'd hear less of the get over it. Well, it, it, apart, it, a they, to do that. it did have a chance and unfortunately they failed. Yeah. They, they did fail. Yeah. And I think that's why it's now the 20 year reunion of the TRC. And I tuned on and I saw a very famous um, a journalist at the time who was covering the story and he was being interviewed and he said you know the biggest problem with the TRC was that it failed to address the fact that it needed to enlighten the white, white um, demographic of the fact that what you are being given is a gift yes. and you are being gifted this opportunity to restart and re readdress what has yeah. been done yeah, I mean, because you, you, you can't be the one who's arrogant when I'm forgiving you, you know? And, 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 and that's the feeling that a lot of black people are, are getting. You know? Because you must remember that our folks, they had to deal with the, with, the, with the deaths of our fathers and so forth. And then after that, make like, sure we go to school, that we, we, we get a better education and so forth. And that, that was the focus. So now the younger ones are, are kind of free enough to, you know, to say, actually, you know what? That whole thing was BS. In fact, the way you people are treating us is still BS. Your arrogance is BS. Because our folks and we are the ones who, who had to do this whole forgiveness thing. You know? But your arrogance doesn't show any, you know, humility, any, yeah, we're equal. It shows, it's an arrogance of, yeah, well, we here, you here, get over it. You know, so, and then other situations where uh, socially, you know, you still have to, you can't voice this being a black person out because, ah, oh, come on, I don't come with that. We're trying to have a drink. You know, I go to work, no one knows any, you know, African okay. language. How, how, how is it that no one knows an African language? You know, I have to, as a black person, always adapt to these spaces, always adapt, always, 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 and it's tiring. It's tiring, that's the thing though. You talk my language, I'll talk your language. You know, it can't always be giving, 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 giving forgiveness, uh, giving our culture, our language away just to adopt. Well, I think everything you said, the only word that really comes to mind is respect. But just saying, I respect you as a human being and I respect your identity. And I think that is the biggest step we can take forward, teaching people to actually respect other people. And acknowledgement. Well. Acknowledging and respect. It's, it's literally about, let's recognize that we are all in this country and if we really, really, really mean this thing, then uh, let's put it down the middle and all... Standing that one line and just be there, you know.